Hi there, this is Dr. Laura Jones, and today I am doing a video for you on the gut microbiome. Let's start with a quick review. A biome is a distinct ecosystem characterized by its environments and its inhabitants. The miniature biome made up of trillions of microscopic organisms that resides inside our gastrointestinal tract has been named the microbiome. The microbes that comprise the microbiome include over a thousand different species of bacteria, viruses, fungi, and in many of us, parasites. The trillions of microorganisms that live in the microbiome affect each other and their environment in various ways. In fact, they appear to influence many aspects of our overall health within the body, both inside the digestive tract and outside of it. Let's talk about the factors that influence the microbiome. Your gut microbiome is unique to you. Infants inherit their first microbes during delivery and breastfeeding, and as we grow, nutrition and other environmental exposures introduce new microbes into the microbiome. It's important to note some of these exposures provide us with beneficial flora, and some, unfortunately, provide us with maybe harmful or less beneficial bacteria. Most of the microorganisms in our gut have a symbiotic relationship with us. They're hosts. That means that we both benefit from the relationship. We provide them with food and shelter, and in return, the microbes in the gut help protect us and help us to improve our health. I often tell my patients, imagine your microbiome as a lush garden, rich with fruits and vegetables and flowers. When the garden is thriving and healthy, we are thriving and healthy. And if the soil becomes compromised or polluted or if pests or weeds overgrow, imbalances set in and the health of the microbiome declines. Your gut microbiome interacts with many of your body's systems and assists with many bodily functions. It plays such an active role in your body that some healthcare providers have described it as being almost an organ in itself. Some of these interactions we're still learning about, but other functions we understand quite well. So let's talk about the ones we know a lot about at this point in time. Let's start with the digestive tract. The bacteria of the microbiome help to break down complex carbohydrates and dietary fibers that we cannot break down on our own. They produce something called short chain fatty acids, which you'll hear a lot about during this video. The short chain fatty acids are a byproduct of the bacteria that serve many important roles in the gut. The bacteria of the microbiome also provide us with enzymes necessary to synthesize certain vitamins such as B1, B9, B12, and vitamin K. Back to short chain fatty acids, they feed the cells in the gut lining and help to keep our overall gut environment healthy. Gut bacteria also help to metabolize bile in the intestines. So your liver sends bile to your small intestine to help you digest your fats. And when that's done, bacteria and their enzymes help to break it down so that the bile acids can be resorbed and recycled by your liver. The microbiome also influences our immune system. So beneficial microbes in your gut help to train your immune system. In fact, your gut is your largest immune system organ, containing up to 80% of your body's immune cells. These cells help to clear out many of the pathogens that pass through the gut every day. Helpful gut microbes also compete directly with non-beneficial microbes for real estate and nutrients in the gut, preventing non-beneficial microbes from taking over, taking up too much territory within the digestive tract. The short-chain fatty acids we just discussed made by the beneficial flora are actually anti-inflammatory and support a healthy gut barrier, keeping the bacteria and the bacterial toxins inside the intestine so that they don't escape into our bloodstream. The nervous system is an area we are learning more about every day how this system is influenced by the microbiome. Gut microbes can affect your nervous system through something called the gut-brain axis. This is a network of nerves, neurons, and neurotransmitters that runs through our gastrointestinal tracts. Certain bacteria actually produce or stimulate the production of neurotransmitters. One of those is serotonin, one you might have heard a lot about as well. And by doing so, we can send chemical signals from the gut to the brain. Bacterial products may also affect your nervous system, so short-chain fatty acids appear to have a positive effect, while toxins from non-beneficial bacteria might have a damaging effect. Research continues to investigate how your gut microbiome might be involved in various neurological and behavioral concerns, as well as pain and mood disorders. 
The endocrine system is also influenced by the microbiome. Gut microbes and their products also interact with endocrine cells in the gut lining. These cells are called enteroendocrine cells, and they secrete hormones that regulate various aspects of our body, including our metabolism, our blood sugar, our hunger, and our satiety. Now, where is the microbiome? It's hiding out in the digestive tract, and when we say the gut, we mean the stomach, the small intestine, but the majority of those microbes are in the large intestine or the colon. They float around inside or attach to the mucus lining on the inner walls of the gut. Now I want to talk about a term called dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is a term that refers to an unbalanced or unhealthy gut microbiome and unfortunately it's a bit more common than we'd like to see. This imbalance can occur due to various factors, but there's three most common factors that we're going to talk about. One, the imbalance could be a decrease in the diversity of microbes in the gut. Two, a loss of the beneficial microbes in the gut. Or three, an imbalance due to an overgrowth of harmful microbes in the gut. A loss of beneficial bacteria leaves your gut vulnerable to more disease-causing or invasive types of bacteria. However, dysbiosis is not so much about the microbes themselves as much as it is about the effects those microbes have on the host and the relationship between the host and the microbes. This, of course, affects the health of the whole person. This means that dysbiosis is actually a disruption in the homeostasis of the gut flora. This disruption results in changes in the composition of the microbiome, as well as, and just as important, the metabolic activities of the microbiome and the interactions of these metabolites with the host's biochemistry. Now, this can present in a variety of ways depending on the patient. There have been over a thousand different metabolites of the gut bacteria that have been measured to date, and some estimate that there are actually thousands that have been yet to be identified. Factors influencing the microbiome and the vulnerability to dysbiosis are also important to understand. These are things that we might be listening for when I'm sitting down talking to my patients. So the first one I want to talk about is nutrition. Absolutely, nutrition affects the microbiome. The array of microorganisms in your gut microbiome require a variety of plant fibers in order to thrive. Different organisms prefer different whole foods, and in turn, those microorganisms produce metabolites and byproducts that further nourish your gut, favoring more healthy, beneficial microbes. So the cycle goes on in a positive fashion. Another factor that influences our microbiome is our exposure to toxins. So certain chemicals poison your microbiome, uh, especially if we are exposed to large amounts of them or small amounts of them routinely. This includes environmental toxins such as alcohol, tobacco smoke, pollutants, For example, our herbicides or pesticides that could be on our foods. Pesticides and antibiotics actually can wipe out a lot of our good bacteria um, along with the bad. Uh, In addition, we also have to think about preservatives in our food as potentially being toxic for our gut microbiome. Certain medications like acid blockers can affect our microbiome because they change the pH of the gut. Now, your gut microbiome can usually recover from a temporary chemical exposure, like a brief prescription of antibiotic, for example. But chronic exposure certainly can affect its composition long term. So if you take certain medications or use substances like alcohol frequently, it may prevent certain microbes from thriving in your gut. The diversity of the microbiome also affects the health of the total microbiome, meaning a healthy microbiome has many different types of microorganisms that support each other. Consider how different plants in a garden cross-pollinate or nourish the soil for each other. In contrast, a microbiome that doesn't support a healthy variety of microorganisms is more vulnerable to being overrun by the invasive species. So without healthy competition, these weeds and pests will start to dominate in the microbiome just like they do in the garden and deplete the resources that other types of flora need to survive. Your motility also influences the microbiome. By motility, I mean the regular movement of your bowels. This is how your crop of microorganisms turns over. After traveling through your colon, where they help break down undigested compounds into nutrients you can absorb, 
many of those microbes are eliminated with your stool. How long it takes for this process to occur can affect your microbiome. The movement of food or waste through your gastrointestinal tract helps to distribute different microbes into different places along the way. So this is very important. In fact, we can see imbalances in the microbiome crop up just from either motility that is too fast or too slow. Sleep is another factor that I want to talk about that absolutely can affect the microbiome. This is an area where we certainly need more research, but so far research shows that the host sleep time or the disruption in their circadian rhythm will lead to a change in the normal intestinal microbiota exercise also affects the microbiome. Exercise itself has actually a very beneficial effect on it. There are treatments used by high-level athletes employing certain probiotics to adjust the microbiome in ways that affects the nervous system and their performance. And again, this is an area where we are excited to have more research. This is one we see a lot in clinical practice. Stress absolutely affects the microbiome. So stress and depression, anxiety, reshape the gut's bacterial composition. This occurs through different stress hormones that are released, for example, cortisol, inflammatory markers that are released, or autonomic alterations. In turn, the gut bacteria then have changed, and then they release different metabolites, toxins, or neurohormones that continue to alter the microbiome and affect us uh, as far as our mood, as far as our behaviors. So again, this is a fascinating area that um, has a lot of research ongoing at this point in time. Let's talk about the conditions that are related to dysbiosis. There are several that we know for sure are directly related to the microbiome. One in particular, of course, is infection. So any type of invasive pathogen, of course, a disease-causing organism, can temporarily or chronically cause us to have fluctuations in the gut flora. This can cause diarrhea, this can cause inflammation, this can cause damage to the gut lining. Some types of pathogens even directly invade the gut barrier, threatening to escape into the bloodstream and go systemic. So dysbiosis weakens your gut defense against pathogens. It's also important to note that gut dysbiosis can lead to increased permeability of the intestinal barrier, and this results in a low-grade systemic inflammation or metabolic disorders. It has been correlated with such disorders as obesity, type 2 diabetes, uh, and seen uh, to exist in higher amounts in patients who've had ischemic stroke. Another condition that directly relates to dysbiosis is SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which we see a lot of in my medical practice. This is a dysbiosis in the small intestine. Now, the presence of SIBO means certain types of bacteria in the small intestine have overgrown and are using too many resources and producing way too many byproducts. Um, in some cases, bacteria from your large intestine might have migrated up to the small intestine and settled in where they don't really belong. And this can result in a change in gut motility and a wide array of digestive discomforts. Classic presentation would be a lot of bloating, a lot of gas a lot of irritation or flatulence, um, that feeling of being full way too easily. So we, we do see this a lot. Inflammatory bowel disease is another concern, a condition that is directly related to dysbiosis. And that is, of course, a collection of autoimmune conditions related to dysbiosis, including ulcerative colitis, microscopic colitis, and Crohn's disease. Lastly, it's important to note on here, atherosclerosis is another health concern related to dysbiosis caused by unhealthy gut bacteria contributing to your overall cardiovascular risk. In the case of atherosclerosis, a byproduct called TMAO builds up in the arteries, contributing to hardening of the artery walls. We also see conditions that may be indirectly related to dysbiosis. So as a naturopathic doctor and functional medicine provider, when I'm taking a patient's case, I'm listening for all of these concerns. And um, a lot of these symptoms may be present in patients with dysbiosis. It doesn't mean for sure they have dysbiosis, but it's something to be on the lookout for. So um, these include allergies, asthma, anxiety and depression, IBS, obesity, 
different autoimmune conditions and certainly different neurodegenerative conditions. In my experience, most patients with complex chronic disease have some form of dysbiosis. Most common symptoms and signs that present in dysbiosis, of course, are what I just spoke about with SIBO, right? Gas and pain, um, some cramping, a bloated abdomen, just poor digestion overall with a vulnerability to either constipation or diarrhea. Patients will complain of lower abdominal pain often and halitosis. Less commonly associated symptoms or signs um, that may mean dysbiosis is present include fatigue, arthralgia or myalgia, mental fogginess, or chronic congestion. And, you know, we're taking a complete case uh, when we're assessing for this because there are a lot of things, right, that can cause these signs or symptoms, but dysbiosis certainly is in the running. Let's talk about the classes and locations of dysbiosis again. So classes include bacterial dysbiosis, fungal or yeast dysbiosis, and protozoal dysbiosis. As we spoke about earlier, this could occur in the large intestine, the small intestine, the stomach, or even the esophagus or mouth. And when we're talking about bacterial dysbiosis, I want to make sure that I review there are different types of bacterial dysbiosis. So the bacteria in the colon, we categorize them in three ways. We categorize them as beneficial, we categorize them as commensal or pathogenic. So beneficial means they have particular benefit for us. Commensal means they are a normal part of a microbiome. However, they can cause trouble for us if they overgrow. So if the ratio of them shifts, we can actually see symptoms and signs that the gut is not as healthy. And then pathogenic makes sense. Of course, these are microbes that are known to be pathogenic and are known to be disease causing. When we see a patient that we think may have dysbiosis, we absolutely want to do our best to identify exactly where that imbalance resides, what organisms are involved, and then we can better decide what to do to try to help them. So testing for dysbiosis is an, an important area I want to make sure to cover well. Testing for dysbiosis usually is done with stool panels that assess um, using a variety of methods to detect beneficial, commensal, or pathogenic flora. These include several different methodologies, microscopy, uh, enzyme-linked immunoassays, culture methodologies, PCR. Um, we also actually look at microbe metabolites and genome sequencing at this point in time. So it's become quite sophisticated over the years. And what's awesome is that a lot of stool panels employ several different types of these technologies together so we can get a very good assessment about where the health of the gut lies and what we need to do for our patients. I want to talk a bit about the stool testing first. So in particular, the panels that I use absolutely use uh, microscopy and ELISA testing, as well as culture methods and PCR. And all of this together, I find, is really helpful. We can take the most lovely things from each methodology to create a nice picture about the patient's gut health. We also use breath testing and urinary organic acid testing to test for some types of dysbiosis. So breath testing is most commonly known for SIBO and H. pylori diagnosis. Breath tests involve a patient drinking a beverage that contains either fructose or lactulose or glucose, and then they are instructed to exhale into a bag or tubes at specific intervals. This can be a little time consuming, but it's worth it in order for us to really try to understand what's going on for the patient. So the lab looks for certain elevations and certain gases that it wouldn't expect to be present. Um, in the patient's breath, and then we can make a diagnosis. So a rapid rise in exhaled hydrogen or methane are two of the things we're looking for in a SIBO test. Urinary organic acid testing is also really valuable to assess for dysbiosis. This could be part of a stool panel or just an organic acid panel. Organic acids are substances that result from the metabolic processes in your body. We can measure them in the urine, 
And analyzing these metabolites from different metabolic pathways can provide a lot of insight into important areas related to our gut health. So in particular, microbial organic acid testing measures the metabolites produced by yeast and by bacteria in the urine and elevated values of these organic acids may indicate bacterial or yeast dysbiosis. It wouldn't be a complete stool and gut assessment without the detection of parasites. So, um, you know, I don't see this all that often, but we certainly do see it. So O and P is done. Uh, we can also look for parasites with ELISA testing and PCR testing. I want to talk just a bit about one particular species of parasite that we do see more commonly here in the U.S. Clinically, in about 20% of our patients that we test, we find positive parasite results, and this is most often due to blastocystis hominis. There is varying data, but in the Western world, where most of the testing has been done, there have been up to 17 different strains of blastocystis hominis identified, all with different degrees of pathogenicity associated. Associated with them. Interestingly, less than half the people with blastocystis are symptomatic with gastrointestinal symptoms. So people with blastocystis may or may not be symptomatic. Um, we look for this more in patients who have IBS because people with blastocystis are four times more likely to have IBS. And when treated, about four out of five of them improve as far as their gastrointestinal symptoms go. So is it possible that folks with no digestive symptoms in the presence of blastocystis could still have gut hyperpermeability due to the infection? Yes, and perhaps they have symptoms outside of the digestive tract that we have not recognized may be related. So that's something to keep in mind. We may not necessarily want to treat right away. We may want to see if they're symptomatic, but not just digestive symptoms, we might want to look outside of the gut. There also has been evidence that certain parasites affect the tight junctions in the gut, so the tight junctions in the actual gut wall, leading to intestinal permeability issues and more likely result in what we can call leaky gut or food sensitivities. So uh, lastly, regarding parasites and why we may want to treat even if we do not see symptoms with a patient who tests positive for blastocystis hominis, there also is some evidence that the presence of parasites may increase increased mast cell activity, resulting in an exaggerated histamine response. So there may be secondary pathology related to an increased intestinal permeability or an exaggerated histamine response that we're not necessarily going to see digestive symptoms, but maybe joint or skin symptoms in these patients. I have seen other types of parasites occasionally here uh, in New Hampshire, <laughs> um, but not often. Uh, typically, that part of the stool panel is uh, coming back negative. Now, when we talk about stool testing and dysbiosis regarding bacteria and yeast, we're most commonly using stool culture, PCR, metabolomics, or organic acids to help us with this diagnosis. As we know, various bacteria and yeast are part of our normal flora. It's only when they are out of balance or truly pathogenic that we want to treat. I say this because... We don't want to necessarily use antimicrobial medications or antimicrobial herbs unless we absolutely have to. Why? Because we have a lot of good flora in that microbiome that we're trying to preserve and protect. So the list of methods that we most commonly employ to detect bacterial or yeast dysbiosis here in my office are stool culture, which of course represents microbes in the colon and identifies only about 1% of the microbes present in that colon. So that's another thing to keep in mind. PCR, in recent years, we've been able to employ PCR probes to aid in evaluating diversity and abundance of flora throughout the intestine. Of course, metabolomics, we've got our short chain fatty acids and other metabolites that we look at in organic acids, which we just went through. Bacterial and fungal dysbiosis markers. So these can be measured uh, in an organic acid assessment. So as I mentioned earlier, microbial organic acid testing measures the metabolites produced by yeast and bacteria and elevated values of these organic acids may indicate yeast or bacterial dysbiosis. I've listed some of the organic acids found most commonly with these two types of dysbiosis and we look for these on our assessments and they do often help us to kind of seal the deal um, as far as what could be troubling our patients the most. 
I definitely think short chain fatty acids are worthy of a little segment all uh, all to themselves. Definitely another marker we can measure when assessing for dysbiosis. These are starch and non-starch polysaccharides from malabsorbed carbohydrates or non-digestible fibers that are fermented by enzymes in the colonic bacteria. Um, in this process, short-chain fatty acids are created, which become fuel for the cholinocytes. So really important examples of the fatty acids that we want to see in the gut are butyrate, acetate, and propionate, and they all have different effects on the gut, but in particular, butyrate rate is the principal fuel for the colon. Now it's also important to note, and some stool testing panels will identify these, valerate, isovalerate, and isobutyrate constitute the putrefactive short-chain fatty acids. So these are fatty acids that actually are not quite as beneficial for us. They're putrefactive and suggest underlying protein maldigestion, malabsorption, or SIBO. So short-chain fatty acids are the ones we really want to see, butyrate, acetate, propionate. These are anti-inflammatory and have immunomodulatory effects in the colon. They also help regulate cell proliferation and differentiation in the colon. So those are the three we want to see nice and high. Remember in dysbiosis, as we spoke about just a few moments ago, the imbalance can be due to a decrease in diversity of the entire microbiome, loss of some of our beneficial flora that are so important for things to remain balanced, or overgrowth of harmful microbiota. In my work with patients, the most commonly overgrown bacteria that I see in clinical practice are Enterobacteriaceae, which are correlated with inflammatory conditions such as IBD, obesity, and colorectal cancer. Klebsiella species, which have some correlation with autoimmune issues, in particular ankylosing spondylitis, and then Pseudomonas species, which we see correlate with IBD and lupus. Now, if we take a deeper look on some of the wonderful panels that we have access to, they'll do an assessment um, that looks at a wide variety of markers, which allow us to make a thorough summary of the health of the gut. So these assessments often combine our PCR, our culture methods, our assays, biochemical assays, and microscopy, which help us to detect the status of pathogens, including viruses, parasites, and bacteria in the gut. So a really fantastic look. It also can be overwhelming. It's important if you're going to run a panel like this with patients that you go through it thoroughly with them because there's a lot of information and if it isn't explained well to the patient, they can get really overwhelmed or really worry about one or two markers that might be elevated or low. And as I said earlier, it's really about the whole picture, the whole balance of the microbiome. Other markers that we want to pay a lot of attention to involve factors that influence the gut mucosa, the protective barriers, and the um, anti-inflammatory aspects of a good healthy microbiome. So summary pages are often given on these test reports that look closely at our butyrate producing bacteria, um, our gut mucosa protective bacteria, which include Acromantia, which is a species of bacteria that's gotten a lot of attention lately. A deficiency of Acromantia not only can be associated with disruption of the mucosal layer, which is so important to plenty of health in, in the gut, but actually Acromantia now we know is one of the species identified as playing a critical role in body composition, um, with a deficiency of it being linked to obesity. In addition, some of the markers that we're looking at tell us more about the gut barrier protective qualities of the microbiome, as well as the anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory aspects of the microbiome. So when we say pro-inflammatory, bacteria that have been identified as actually contributing to inflammation in the gut if they are overgrown are your proteobacteria, Shigella, and E. coli species. Since we're talking about bacteria, I want to just touch also on H. pylori. So bacterial dysbiosis, um, it certainly fits in this category. H. pylori is an oldie, but it's still around, that is for sure. Some subtypes and strains absolutely are associated with digestive symptoms, and even um, some strains are associated with gastric cancer. The urea breath test is the gold standard of testing, and stool testing actually has started to be shown to be about as effective as the urea breath test. 
The PCR testing detects even when levels are really low, and I caution you about this because some of these stool panels that are so awesome in so many ways do look for H. pylori, and just because a patient comes back with a very low positive does not mean necessarily that H. pylori is present in a pathogenic amount, so that means it does not necessarily need to be treated. It's really important to consider this, as I was saying earlier about bacteria and yeast. If we're going to treat, we want to make sure that it is a symptomatic overgrowth because we really should be only treating those that are having symptoms um, for the most part. We need to consider we are dealing with what type of population. Is it a native microbiome? For example, 75% of native Alaskans are going to be positive for H. pylori and probably do not need to be treated. Um, however, if a patient is symptomatic, we absolutely want to treat. Um, the reason we are being so careful is not only to protect the beneficial microbiome, but also we want to be aware that there is an awful lot of antibiotic resistant to the triple therapy and then we don't want to be contributing to that. So um, if PCR is positive, we may want to get a stool antigen test and assess for symptoms before we treat for H. pylori. Yeast dysbiosis. This doesn't get a lot of recognition in the conventional medical community, but it certainly is something that we see a lot of in my functional medicine practice. And when we treat a patient who is symptomatic with yeast dysbiosis, they tend to do fantastic. So I'm very grateful that we have the ability to identify yeast dysbiosis and treat it. There are actually over 250 different species of fungi that can be in our gut. Uh, so that's a whole lot. However, the most common commensal species that I see in my practice absolutely is Candida albicans. Um, I typically am finding this on a stool microbiology with a culture. So it's growing on the Petri dish, which is awesome because then they can do a culture and sensitivity. So I can find out what tool to use to rebalance the gut and use as an antimicrobial. Candida albicans, however, is a normal part of our microbiome. That's very important to remember. It's only a problem when it overgrows. So the average patient will have none to rare Candida albicans on a stool assessment. When it's overgrown, it really can cause some trouble. So patients can see a lower mucosal immunity, and so they are more likely to have a lot of GI symptoms. It contributes to gas and bloating, and I've seen both diarrhea and constipation be involved in a yeast dysbiosis picture. So with that lowered mucosal immunity we can see with overgrowth of yeast, this can contribute to an altered immune response, which will absolutely eventually result in increased inflammation and we can see associated diseases in the gut as well as mitochondrial dysfunction. So that's something to keep in mind. You know, patients with yeast dysbiosis, we often will um, see they complain of fatigue uh, as well as cognitive concerns. So don't forget about the value also of looking at metabolomics and metagenomics if we have access to them. I say that because some really tricky cases that you can't quite figure out, these might be nice tools to employ, or you may find a stool panel, a uh, stool assessment, a gut dysbiosis assessment panel that will also include these markers. So these are starting to become more commonly employed in assessing gut health, and it really does give us an even greater idea about the diversity of the microbiome, where imbalances are present, and the activity of the population. So it tells us how the microbiome is playing out in the host. Uh, these gut panels that are so valuable that we run quite often in my practice look at several other factors that may be of value as well. So I want to briefly review what else we might see in our assessments for dysbiosis. So red blood cells, white blood cells, muscle and vegetable fibers are also looked for. Of course, red blood cells indicate active bleeding of the lower GI tract, where white blood cell elevation indicates the presence of in, an inflammatory process. Um, muscle and vegetable fibers can be assessed as they indicate incomplete digestion that perhaps may involve either poor mastication or low secretion of hydrochloric acid or poor pancreatic enzyme output. Um, we also can see charcot leyden crystals, which are formed when eosinophils break down. So the presence of these crystals may indicate parasitic disease. 
Uh, we can look at elastase, uh, pancreatic enzyme. Of course, low elastase indicates pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. And it's important to note that this may be legit and actually low, or it could be low um, due to fluid dilution. So it's important to always check out the reported stool consistency of the stool specimen when you're taking a look at that marker. Fecal fat is a test that also may be of value. It's a reliable marker for fat malabsorption. And we may see this in patients who have pancreatic insufficiency secondary to biliary tract disease. Inflammatory markers, I always take a glance at these and make sure they're negative when I'm assessing um, the gut. Lactoferrin is a biomarker of significant gastrointestinal inflammation, so often associated with IBD. Lysozyme is a biomarker of um, anti-inflammatory immune response in the gut and can be slightly increased with overgrowth of enteropathogens such as yeast and dysbiotic bacteria. And market elevations are correlated with IBD. Um, calprotectin, of course, is elevation of calprotectin is associated with IBD and gastrointestinal inflammation, colitis, and at times even cancer. So when we see elevation of these inflammatory markers, we want to pay a lot of attention to them and make sure we understand why they're elevated. And if we don't have a firm understanding of why they're elevated, we need to refer uh, to gastroenterology. I prefer to have my patients worked up by GI anytime I see chronic elevation of these that we haven't been able to bring back down in a timely fashion. Secretory IgA represents the first line defense of the gastrointestinal mucosa. So elevated fecal secretory IgA can result from the presence of pathogenic bacteria, parasites, yeast, viruses. It can be low in the case of chronic mental or physical stress. Also can be low with a nutrient deficiency. So actually when I see low secretory IgA, I'm also often thinking about their adrenal health um, and the stress that they're under um, and their nutrition. So something to think about there. Ideally, stool pH, another marker that we want to look at, is going to be slightly acidic. This can be positively influenced by short-chain fatty acid um, status, um, and we want to pay particular attention when the pH shifts to more alkaline because several GI pathogens tend to thrive in a more alkaline environment, and of course this leads to more dysbiosis. The last marker that I pay a lot of attention to in these panels is beta-glucuronidase. Beta-glucuronidase is an enzyme that's involved in a protective process that limits absorption and enterohepatic reabsorption of toxins. So studies have indicated a correlation with high beta-glucuronidase activity with higher circulating estrogens and lower fecal estrogen in a premenopausal woman. And we have seen some correlation with high beta-glucuronidase activity in certain cancers. So something to keep in mind. We really want to fix that for our patients. So some things like DIM or I3C, making sure they're getting plenty of fiber and really looking at um, the good flora in the gut, making sure that we have plenty of that are very important there. So now that we've talked a lot about the microbiome and dysbiosis and ways to assess for dysbiosis and what some of those markers mean on the panels that you might use to make that assessment, let's talk a little bit about a functional medicine approach to dysbiosis. So the focus of any treatment, functional medicine treatment for dysbiosis is to simply rebalance the microbiome. And there's a few ways to do this. So the first step in addressing the dysbiosis is absolutely weeding out any pathogenic parasites that you may have identified. And in some of our panels, we actually um, are seeing that viruses are tested for as well. So in that case, of course, weeding out any virus that we may have identified. In my office, this is often done with antimicrobial herbs, such as oregano, thyme, or garlic. Those are just a few that I use most often. Um, at times, antibiotic treatment absolutely is a consideration. As we are aware, antibiotic treatment negatively impacts the diversity and balance of the microbiome. So that really does mean herbs as well. It's important to note that most antibiotic herbs do knock down the flora or alter the balance of the microbiome just like an antibiotic. So perhaps the herb might not be as toxic to the whole organism, but it does have a negative influence on the microbiome. So we want to use them effectively but conservatively. So studies show us that even 18 to 24 months out from a round of an antimicrobial agent, the microbiome 
realm is just still starting to regain balance from that disturbance. So that's something to really keep in mind when we treat. We want to always make sure we're using our antimicrobials very wisely and conservatively. So example studies have looked at the prevalence of obesity in kids who have been treated with antibiotics for recurring infections. And we believe that this is related to the changes that antimicrobials have made on their microbiome. We also see that many adult patients with long histories of fungal overgrowth had a significant antibiotic or antimicrobial history. So we need to be certain we are not being overly aggressive with the gut, even when we're using natural antimicrobials, when we're initiating this weeding out process. So first step, weed out the pathogens. Also though, important to remember, we also want to weed out inflammatory foods. So weeding refers to taking out foods from the nutrition plan that we know are not aiding in healing the gut or healing the health of the organism. We want to help our patients to identify pro-inflammatory foods that may also be contributing to imbalances or inflammation. So an elimination diet is a short-term diet. I say short-term because a lot of the time we can forget to that. We want to get our patients back to eating a variety of really good foods for their whole body and we want to foster and protect their relationship with food. So it's not that they can't ever have sugar ever again, um, but for at least temporarily while we're trying to rebalance the gut and address the dysbiosis, we want to help them to significantly reduce the pro-inflammatory foods that could be contributing to the imbalances. So these could include things like simple sugars, um, simple starches, alcohol, 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 sugars. Sometimes when we're trying to rebalance, particularly in the case of SIBO, we want to also have them eliminate high FODMAP foods. Um, so these could be foods that have been identified um, also through an IgG food panel uh, showing that those foods are triggering an IgG response. And so we do use IgG food sensitivity panels in some of my patients, especially if they're not responding to a dysbiosis treatment the way I would expect. Sometimes it means there are other foods involved where that they have developed sensitivity to. And again, that doesn't mean they're going to be off of them forever. It means they might need um, at least a short break from those foods. So when too many microbes are eating the inflammatory foods, it usually means that there's going to be an overgrowth and that those microbes are probably not beneficial microbes. And so um, what happens is they overgrow, they produce too many byproducts, and this can absolutely cause a lot of symptoms, mainly in the digestive tract. So along with using antimicrobials to address the overgrowth, we also can starve the pathogen or imbalanced flora by using nutrition. Another important part of treatment to address dysbiosis is called seeding the gut. We want to seed the gut after we weed the gut. So ideally we're seeding with good flora. Um, so supplemental probiotic um, is important to use as part of a treatment plan for dysbiosis. Supplemental probiotics did not necessarily colonize. That's important to remember. But each high quality probiotic dose stays active within the GI tract for about two weeks. So with the ingestion of the probiotic comes a beneficial rebalancing of the gut pH. Um, and this positively influences the microbiome so that colonized beneficial flora are more likely to thrive. Specific probiotics are helpful for specific conditions. And this is important to remember. Some species of probiotic are certainly better for certain health conditions than others. An example here would be Espilardi in the treatment of Clostridium difficile. One other way probiotics help to rebalance the microbiome is a phenomenon called competitive inhibition uh, that we learn about in uh, microbiology class uh, way back in our education. But the dosing of beneficial flora tends to push out the non-beneficial flora. So just reseeding with good flora, actually, that alone can serve to push out pathogenic or commensal bacteria. So this is another reason why probiotic therapy can be so helpful. Because of their low toxicity, we can use probiotics enthusiastically to keep in mind that um, if a high load, you want to absolutely keep in mind, if a high load of pathogenic bacteria or yeast are present on your culture or microscopic exam, um, you want 
want to be careful when you start a probiotic to not go too fast with too high of a dose because sometimes the patient can have an exacerbation of symptoms if we kill off a lot of that bacteria all at one time. We can see things like an exacerbation of diarrhea, gas, bloating. We can also see things like rashes or itching um, or more pain or lethargy pop up due to killing off things really quickly. So sometimes starting with a lower dose probiotic and slowly increasing the amount the patient takes over time is a better way um, for our patients with more severe symptoms or our patients who have more sensitive constitutions. So it's also good to know and remember that probiotics in themselves are really awesome for the health of the whole organism. So they regulate immune function in the host. They support that mucosal barrier of the gut. They help to regulate motility of the bowel and modulate inflammation, both systemically, systemic inflammation, and local inflammation in the gut. In addition, we see that metabolically, probiotics have a beneficial effect on the gut and various types of dysbiosis. Recent research is revealing that probiotics positively influence the signaling of the central nervous system. So production of your serotonin through the gut wall and the production of immune cytokines, all having a positive impact on the brain itself. In fact, there are certain probiotics that are having very positive outcomes in the treatment of anxiety and depression, as well as cognitive concerns. And so with further research, we hope to find specific probiotic species and optimal doses for a variety of health conditions. The last step of addressing dysbiosis from a functional medicine perspective is restoring the health of the gut wall and encouraging healthy functioning of the digestive tract so this doesn't happen again. So we know the microbiome is affected by age, genetics, and several different modifiable lifestyle factors, but more than anything, we focus here on the diet because it is so powerful. So shifts in nutrition can affect the makeup of the microbiome in less than a day. So soluble fibers in the diet increase short chain fatty acid production and of course we know that this serves as fuel for our beneficial flora that make up the microbiome. Some short chain fatty acids stay present in the small intestine to serve as that fuel source um, and others move into the colon such as butyrate. Fermented foods in the diet, once we have corrected the dysbiosis, I can't stress that enough, once the patient is really feeling better and you're feeling confident that you're well on your way to rebalancing, this is where fermented foods can come in and restore and maintain diversity in the microbiome. And of course, we want to encourage a whole foods diet rich in fiber and at times when appropriate, rich in prebiotic foods and have a talk with our patients about protecting that good flora. And that often may include trying trying to focus more on foods that are organic so they don't have pesticides and herbicides on them that can negatively impact the microbiome, but also focusing more on the whole foods in order to avoid preservatives in our food, which also do a number on the microbiome. So that was a lot, but that completes today's lesson on the microbiome and a reminder of just how important the microbiome is for a healthy gut, but also for the health of the entire human. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Thanks so much for listening. Again, Dr. Laura Jones, naturopathic doctor. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye.